Well, good morning um, or good afternoon by now. My, my name is Eric Brenner, and I teach uh, part-time at the uh, Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the School of Public Health just across the street. Uh, and we're here on the occasion of World TB Day. This says March 26th. World TB Day is actually March 24th, but that was a Saturday, so we couldn't celebrate it on a Saturday this year. Uh, we did have uh, a similar meeting uh, on the 23rd at the medical school, and I thought we would have a little session here so others uh, on the main campus would be able to come as well. So we'll talk a little bit uh, about World TB Day and talk a little bit about TB uh, and a little reflection from not only, not so much from a clinical point of view, but from an, an epidemiologic and public health point of view. So as you see here, it says, and informal musings. So you will muse and reflect a lot. And by the way, thank you for coming out on your lunch hour on a Monday, which is a very busy day for students and faculty alike. Oh my goodness, this isn't TB. What is this? This is Ebola. Do you remember Ebola madness two years ago, three years ago? Almost four years ago by now on the cover of Time magazine. And then two years ago, Ebola madness had subsided and we had what? Zika madness. So why is it that you can have Ebola and Zika on the cover of Time magazine? Ever seen tuberculosis on the cover of Time magazine? It's very odd. How many cases of Ebola were there in the whole world, actually, in three countries in, in West Africa? Do you remember what those countries were? Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea about 28,000 cases and about 11,000 deaths. Sounds like a lot, 11,000 people dying. And then it was over. Let's take a look uh, a little bit about tuberculosis and see what kind of numbers we have to put Ebola or Zika in perspective. A um, hundred years ago, even in this country, infectious diseases were the leading causes of death. It's very interesting to look back. Even in the Gordas textbook, they show you leading causes of death in, uh, you know, in 1900 and then again in, in 2000. But um, in the U.S. and most developed countries, we've gone through a kind of transition so that the leading causes of death are now what? Quote, chronic diseases. So we have heart disease and, and, and lung disease. Um, oh, welcome. And there's a handout for you down here. And um, what do we call that transition from, from a time when we have infectious diseases as a leading cause of death to chronic diseases? Anybody know? Any of the students? Sometimes just called the, an ep the epidemiologic transition. So much of the world has gone through that, but there are many countries um, which have not. And let's look at leading causes of death. Um, we see ischemic heart disease at the top and stroke, interestingly enough. Then it says lower respiratory tract infections, but those are infections due to many different organisms. You could have the pneumococcus and the streptococcus and, uh, and uh, E. coli and Haemophilus influenza. Please come down in front and you have handouts down here. Thank you. Um, and then a bit further down, you have diarrheal diseases, but that's not just one disease because you can die of what? Cholera or Salmonella or Shigella. Uh, or many different diseases. So the interesting thing here is that tuberculosis is the leading cause of death on planet Earth due to a single infectious agent, higher than HIV even. And it looks, if you look here at the, at the uh, horizontal scale, it's looking as if it's about one million and a half deaths. That's per year. Over 10 years, that would be 10 million deaths. So the 11,000 deaths from Ebola sounds pretty exciting for Time magazine, but it's nothing in comparison, okay? So we're here to think a bit about the World TB Day and Robert Koch. Um, I thought this was kind of cute. The Wikipedia has a list of awareness days, and look at this. I didn't know there was a World Poetry Day. Did, did, did you celebrate that at the School of Public Health? And everybody read a poem? <laughs> and, and the World Theater Day coming up. Uh, and look at this. Oh, oh, April 1st is April Fool's Day. Everybody has to have some kind of day. Uh, but here's World TB Day on March 24th. Uh, this goes back to about 1982, I believe, um, 
or perhaps 84. We'll look at that in a moment here. And uh, since my field is infectious disease epidemiology, uh, I thought it interesting to see that there are numbers of other infectious diseases which also have their day. Oh, leprosy day, how about that? Malaria day, World Rabies Day. I remember going to the first World Rabies Day in, uh, at CDC some years ago. And World AIDS Day is very important uh, on December 1st. So um, on the occasion of these different days, so here we had, for example, at the bottom it says World AIDS Day, December 1st, CDC's MMWR, let me ask how many of the students are familiar with the MMWR? Mostly, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which comes out every Friday, though the secret is it's online by Thursday night. So if you have to give a talk on Friday at midnight, you can go and check the CDC webpage, and the MMWR is there. So on December 1st, of course, um, they'll discuss World AIDS Day and a World Hepatitis Day. This was in 2016. They don't celebrate this every year. There we are, and Hepatitis C. So every, every disease gets its day, day in the sun. Um, well, there's not, not a World Zika Day, but it's it, interesting that two weeks ago we did have a big update about Zika in the U.S. But here is now uh, March 23rd, which was last Friday, celebrating World TB Day, which is actually the 24th. And this is tr has been a tradition for some years. Uh, CDC on World TB Day, uh, third week in March, always updates the public health community and lets us know how many cases of TB we had in the U.S. the previous year, because states have to have all their data in, usually by January 31st, and then it takes CDC a little time to work that out. And if you look uh, here, it says that we had about 9,000 new cases of TB reported last year. Uh, and it's a little something here about something that happened in 1882 when Koch dis announced discover his discovery of Mycobacterium TB, the bacillus that causes TB. It's kind of interesting to look at that. Uh, anyway, in the MNWR, it'll tell you how many cases there were in 2016 and 2017. Oh, we got, South Carolina got down to 101 uh, cases. The states with the most cases are bigger states, as you might imagine, uh, California, uh, New York, Florida, and Texas, okay? And this is also meant for the students here. When you look at uh, the MMWR on the front page, you have a table of contents of what's inside. And look at this, it was a chance to learn about foodborne disease in the US. Oh my goodness, chance to look about information about teen suicide, effect of hurricanes and global on, on health, uh, HIV prevention, yellow fever in travelers. This is very bad news in Brazil. Remember, that's where they had the first Zika cases that we learned about in 2016. Now Zika is essentially gone for complex reasons. Now they're having yellow fever outbreak and tourists going to Brazil are getting yellow fever. And here's something about typhoid fever. Uh, I discussed this with the, with the medical students. I said, Gee, um, uh, those of you in interested in infectious diseases should have a weekly or perhaps at least monthly um, noon session where you go over the articles from the MMWR and find out what's happening with infectious disease in the US and around the world, you know, a year before it's going to be out in the New England Journal of Medicine. All right, back to 1882, and here's Koch in March, uh, March of 1882, March 24th, looking through his microscope. And what is, was he talking about? Here we are, this is the actual initial announcement, Klinische Wochenschrift. Any of you German speakers here? Um, and this is something in art uh, magazine for practicing uh, physicians, okay? And it says, the etiology of tuberculosis. This is so exciting when someone had finally figured it out. Thank you, Robert Koch. But it's interesting to see that this just doesn't say March 24th, it says April 10th. So why is the World TB Day on March 24th? Because this is published April 10th, but based on a, an oral presentation he gave in Berlin on March 24th. Everybody see that? So they're really celebrating the day of the talk 
not the day of the publication, which took another two weeks to come out. In all of Columbia, South Carolina, how many other people know that historical fact? fact? Only us. <laughs> okay. And here's Cocker in his laboratory, both as a younger man and an older man here. Uh, it's interesting to think back of the early years of uh, Nobel Prizes in medicine. And here's, um, so the Nobel Prizes started in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. But here's Koch in 1905 for his investigations and discoveries in relation to TB. I'm giving a little gold star to Ronald Ross. He's the one who figured out that you get malaria from what? From mosquitoes. Does that deserve a Nobel Prize? Certainly, because it wasn't well under understood before. And back to Koch, look at this. 1876, this is what, eight years before he discovered TB, he discovered the bacillus responsible for anthrax. In 1883, he was sent to Egypt as part of a commission to study cholera. And not only, not only did he study cholera, he found he found Vibrio cholera and was able to show that it was a causative agent of cholera. Um, so you see, oh my goodness, this is a time when people were really discovering things. They were, the late uh, 19th century was a golden age for, um, do we have a handout for Dr. Potter here? You have it, John. Uh, it was a golden, golden age for, um, for microbiology. So we're talking here about Koch in Germany and who is Koch's counterpart in France at the same time? What do we do with milk to make it safe to drink? Pasteur, pasteurized milk, that was Louis Pasteur. So Koch and Pasteur were, in a sense, colleagues, but they were also, also rivals. By the way, this gentleman who came in late, with the beard here, uh, is, 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 is Dr. Gil Potter, um, who is the TB clinician who handles TB in 12 counties in South Carolina. He's one of four physicians in the state who are really currently handling TB. Gil, thank you so much for coming. You can give this talk just as well as I could, obviously. I think this is also interesting. Look at this. In 1901, um, he was also recognized for figuring out that the bacillus that causes, the bacilli that cause human and bovine TB are not ident identical. Does anybody know why that's important? Mimi would know because she's from a country where children get what? What vaccine did they get at birth often? BCG, Bacillus of Calmet and Guérin. And what is BCG vaccine? It's the most widely used vaccine on planet Earth. Um, uh, it's, it's what BCG is, is an attenuated mycobacterium bovis. Um, and in our technical seminar on Wednesday, we're going to discuss about s some of the complicated issues that arise because M. bovis and M. TB are closely related and testing for one may give you cross reactions with the other, which makes for real complex epidemiological conundrums. Okay. That'll be on Wednesday. All right. Also, Koch is famous for um, Koch's postulates. You know, how would Koch know that the tubercle bacillus causes TB? Well, <coughs> Uh, what are his postulates? Here is, here is the idea. It's a series of steps. First, you start with an animal. Oh dear, this looks like a dead animal, a guinea pig or a mouse or something. If the mouse dies, and then you can recover from the mouse a certain organism. And then what do you do? Then you isolate the organism, grow it in pure culture in the laboratory, and then what? You inject it into another animal who comes down with what? The same disease, and from that animal, then you recover the same organism. It's kind of stepwise, ver very logical. So these are Koch's postulates. And he said, if you can go through those four steps, then you know that MTB causes tuberculosis or whatnot. It turns out that in the real world, um, in the modern days, this doesn't always apply because not every d disease has a good animal model the way TB does. So there are other, other modifications now. All right, back to a bit of public health. TB on planet Earth. Now, let me ask, you graduated already. Uh, is there any tuberculosis on Mercury or Venus or J Jupiter or Saturn? Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto, pardon me? No idea. I think probably not. Therefore, we're talking about TB in the solar system. Okay? 
Later on, we can discuss about whether there's TB on, on other planets or not. But for the time being, we'll say planet Earth, recognizing that the, the field of study may be larger. So how do we know? So we go to uh, WHO's uh, website and get their global TB report. And they got it out early this year. I'll explain why in a minute. And it's about 250 pages. And here are all the things that you can read. Just an incredible publication. Okay. And here's a, here's a key graph here. Uh, this is looking at incidence of TB. The width of the green are their confidence limits. But the estimate is that if you look at this here, we're right at about 10 million new cases per year on planet Earth. Notice this. This says notifications of new cases. That means how many case reports there are. Now, in South Carolina, we had 101 cases, CDC says, and we had 101 reports because we have a very good surveillance system. Do you think in every country of the world there's a formal reporting system that lets the Minister of Health know exactly how many TB cases there were? Not at all. Therefore, there have to be indirect ways to try and quantify the global burden. That itself is a very fascinating thing, uh, <coughs> Tony. <coughs> Some of them use methods that are bor borrowed from other fields. It's, it's very interesting. Capture, recapture methods and doing surveys and all, all, all kinds of things. But anyway, about 10 million cases, uh, of which a certain number uh, are also infected with HIV. Okay? And this is death, so the, the, the trend is good. It used to be about 1.7 million. <coughs> Looks like we're down to about 1.5, maybe <coughs> 1.4, and a certain number of deaths among HIV-positive people. <coughs> so that puts the global burden in perspective. So we're not talking about little Ebola or little Zika here. We're talking about a million deaths per year. Okay. <coughs> so. In epidemiology, we like to describe things by time, place, and person. This is by time. This is now by what? By place. And if you look here, we see the incidence of TB. We measure TB incidence per 100,000 population. And it looks as if uh, oh, it looks as if the U.S. Oh, and even Mexico next to us. People are so worried about what's coming across the border. It certainly isn't that much TB. There is TB, but not a lot. We, and North America is very low incidence. The darkest green can be above 300 per 100,000. The U.S. is about 2 per 100,000. Compare 2 to 300. Compare something like a lunch that costs $2 to a lunch that costs $300. Okay? And actually, some of the countries in, <coughs> um, around here, um, Angola, Botswana, Mozambique, uh, Zambia, and Zibia, be up, to, be up to 400, 500, 600, 700, 800 per 100,000. Just mind-boggling. Now, India is a bit less, but on the other hand, India has a very large what? Large what? Population. Okay. Um, I'm showing here. Anybody know what country this is? How many of you students have been to Africa? You need to go. You just graduated. You maybe do the Peace Corps first before you go to graduate school. And we'll, dis we'll, dis we'll discuss that dur during the break. We'll come back to that. Okay. This is the Ivory Coast, where I was in the Peace Corps. And this is Guinea, where I'm going in about six weeks as a CDC consultant. Uh, that was one of the countries affected by, by um, Ebola. Um, and the challenge now is to improve the surveillance and response system there, because part of what happened there is that they were slow to detect and respond, and therefore things got out of control for a while. This is interesting. Main methods used to estimate TB incidence. Well, a lot of the world here, uh, case notifications. That's what we have. I'll show you something about the case reporting system. Oh, this is what I was talking about, uh, uh, Tony. Look at this. Nigeria, important country. Uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. They do prevalence surveys. Very complex and expensive to do. And the sample size has to be very large. And what do I mean by prevalence surveys? Uh, in some cases, they're taking x-rays on large proportions of the, I mean, on large numbers of people and then extrapolate, okay? And capture, recapture, oh my goodness, I'm surprised that the British would do this. In Northern Ireland, what is this here? What country is this? Netherlands, oh, Iraq, Egypt, and Yemen. Poor Yemen, they're having so much cholera now. They use a method that um, 
that comes from wildlife people. For example, how do you know how many fish there are in the lake? Anybody know how you do that? Do you dive under the lake and ca catch all the fish and count them? Does anybody know what capture recapture is? It's useful in public health. Someone goes and catches a bunch of fish in a net, keeps them in the water so they don't die, and marks them with an X, and you throw them back in. That was the first sample. That was the capture. Then the recapture might be then, you know, two weeks later, someone goes again and catches a bunch of fish, but some of those will have what on their backs? An X, because they were captured before, and some don't. So you have had two samples, and some of the fish are, are, are were seen in both samples. And there's a nice two-by-two two table, which you can use in some fancy formula, which lets you then, assuming um, random sampling and assuming the even mixing and different assumptions, but anyway, which are usually reasonable, then you have a good way of estimating the number of fish in the pond. So I, what I think they're probably doing here with Capture Recapture, you know, Tony, they're probably looking at notifications that the health department gets, then looking at other sources of information, laboratory results or hospitalization uh, records. You see what I mean? It's like capturing data and then you see how many are common to both and then you use the, f the formula and try to extrapolate. It's a, it's a, it's a cl cl clever statistical method. Okay. <clears throat> well, don't have to worry too much about this. Look at this. In India, about 2 million cases per year. China, about a million. Now, how can a country have a million Gil, how could you have a million cases of TB in a country? If your population is what? A billion, then a million is only what? One, a th one thousandth. So that imagine a village in China with a thousand people. And if one of them has TB, that's one in a thousand. Is that unreasonable or not? It's not. But extrapolate that to a country with a billion people, that would give you your million. We don't have a billion people in, in, uh, in Richland County, do we, Gil? Thank heavens not. Okay. Okay. Um, well, so much for the world. How about TB in the U.S.? Um, and CDC puts out these slides every year <coughs> um, for the previous year. So we don't have the 2017 slides yet, but we'll have them soon. Uh, here's a look at what's happened with TB going back to the early 80s. And actually, if you would follow this curve from way, way back up here, TB was going down, 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 down at about 5% per year. And Tony, once I gave a talk to, to explain, try to explain why is this a 5% per year? Why not 2% per year or 9% per year? It turns out to depend on demography and, and other things, but it's very interesting, but important from a public health point of view, because if it's disease is diminishing by 5% per year, what might happen to your budget? might also diminish. And that's what happened, mm, what happened here in the early 80s. And oh, what else happened that was important in the, in the, in the mid-80s that could affect TB? What well, was just starting then? HIV. So budgets going down, HIV coming up, poor infection control in hospitals. So then TB started going up. And when TB went up, then Congress said, uh-oh, we better give what? More what? More funding. We got more funding. And what happened to TB then? It started going down. So now it's going down, and we're in the era of, of great concern about, about budgets at the federal level. If TB has been going down, what's going to happen to the TB budget? It's going to go down. What's going to happen to TB? Go back up. Okay, we've, 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 we've been, th been there before. Although actually, Gil, I, was, um, I had an email from Jerry Gibson who suggests that I think the CDC budget may be in pretty good shape for next year. But South Carolina gets about a million dollars a year for TB control. Okay, we couldn't do this without federal funds. But I'd like to point out here, this is a bit of a what here? Looks like a bit of a plateau. And this is of some concern, and uh, if we have time, we'll, we'll come back and discuss that. We've kind of leveled off at about 9,000 cases per year. This is going back to 1953, when we started having good, good statistics. Look at this, 80,000 cases. Uh, a little blip here. This is a very sophisticated question. Why was there a blip in 74? Because the definition of what is a case of TB to be counted changed. And sometimes you hear politicians saying, oh, something's going up or something's going down. Um, and sometimes their statement is worth a C or a C minus. 
because 20 of these don't always know what's behind how, how things are, are counted. Okay. Um, then things had a little level, leveling off, 79, 80, 81. Why was that? Because the Vietnam War had ended and the U.S. took in about 1 million refugees from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. You say, oh my goodness, do you mean politics could have an influence on the epidemiology of infectious disease? Absolutely, for things as widespread as TB. Then things went down, and we discussed this, and then funding went down, and then TB went up, and funding went down again, so here we are. Okay? And then here is case rates per 100,000. So interesting, people, uh, I'm sure down at Myrtle Beach, parents are saying, oh, how can we have TB in, in Orwee County? Well, there's TB all over the world, 10 million cases a year. Uh, and case rates now, oh my goodness, in the U U.S. are down to about, what is this, two or three per 100,000. But a few years ago, we were up here, and we'll discuss that in a moment. Now, so here, here's the plateau I was talking about. We're kind of stuck at 9,000 cases a year. This is a challenging slide. We look at cases by time and then by place, and this is looking at cases by what? By person, okay? Age group being a characteristic of people. And it looks as if the highest case rates per 100,000 are in people over 65. Let me ask the students. Well, it's most marked here, and look at this. In 1990, people over, why would people who are, you know, 60, 70, or 80 years old in 1990 have such high uh, TB case rates compared to young people? And by the way, in public health is a team sport, so it's good to reflect collectively. Yeah, decreased uh, uh, immunocompetence, that's what the medical students said, that's true as you age, your immune system may become not as, as robust as it was. But there's another, and these, this is true, so yours is a biological effect and yours is a more sociological effect. There's also, and Tony, this is a, an epidemiologic cohort effect coming from before Comstock was Frost, is that, was, is that his name at, at, uh, at Hopkins? And he studied the kind of the age cohort effect because people who were, uh, let's say, 70 years old in 1990 were born when? In 1920. What was common in 1920? Tuberculosis. And TB is a disease which may manifest itself decades after you were infected. So what we're seeing is, what we're seeing is a kind of a, an effect of successive cohorts who were exposed during childhood to TB at a time where the incidence was higher. And besides the 1920s and 30s and 40s, there were no drugs left to, to treat TB. So this is kind of hard to explain this to, only to, to, to medical students. They think, oh, here's someone who's sick. Why is this person sick? You have to think back into kind of epidemiological terms to a kind of an age cohort effect. It's, it's a very interesting thing, okay? This is also very interesting and important from a, a public health point of view. Uh, this is in green is U.S. born TB going down, 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 down. But what's kind of staying level in blue? Non-U.S. born. Anybody in this country born outside the USA? Mimi, where were you born? Not Colombia, but Colombia. TB is more common in Colombia than in the U.S. Oh, have you been checked for TB since you came here? Oh yes, good. So that, that would be a, a, a uh, of concern. Now South, South America is not the highest, you have, could you have, give her a handout? South America is, uh, is not the highest prevalence in the world, but in terms of, the, for example, the USC Student Health Service, students coming in from Central and Southern Africa would be priorities for testing because t the incidence of TB, as we showed you from the global map, is higher. And we have many people in the U.S., such as Mimi. Actually, in our department, how many people do we have from different countries? We have Germany, and we have China, and we have South America, uh, and we have Italy. I mean, this is a, so a lot of, pardon me? Yeah. Iran, yes? Uh, that's right. And, uh, and, and we have someone also from uh, Azer uh, Lebanon, I think, also. So, so, these, so we don't think about these things, but what we have locally depends upon what's happening globally as well. Okay, won't go into this in detail. In the old days, I think the, gov the federal government used to give states, oh, all right, here's a million dollars, go have a nice program. 
but that's not acceptable anymore. Here's a million dollars for a program, but there are certain measures we want, measures of quality of outcome that we want to have. So one of the indices is what proportion of patients have completed their therapy, for example, within one year. Everybody with me? We've made a lot of progress over the last 20 years on that, okay? Okay, how about TB locally? Here's Georgia, here's North Carolina. Uh, oh, here's South Carolina. Uh, I think my numbers are off by one. Just compare us, so we're down to, just as the U.S. is stuck at about um, 9,000 cases, and South Carolina was stuck in the low hundreds. I think this number is actually 101 here. Um, oh, how come Georgia has 300 cases and we only have 100? Because what? Their population is, is greater. And North Carolina also has about 10 million. And in terms of case rates, we're all in the same ballpark. I look at this over time. Uh, when we had 400 cases, then the 300s, then the 200s, the high 100s. So we're making terrific progress here. A couple of years ago, Gil, do you remember the, uh, the outbreak in Greenwood? Um, I think in the town of, town of 76. And there was even a big um, legislative committee then reviewed that and so forth. Um, I wrote a letter to every legislator to try to give some of this perspective. They said, oh, how can there be TB? I said, well, we always have TB. It's going down, down, down. This is a very good program. I never got an, a single email back from any one of the legislators. I, I had offered to even have uh, a noon session about TB for any of their staffers who might be interested before the hearings were held. Okay. TB cases by county, this is for a five-year period. Um, well, here's what we see. Ch so Charleston, uh, Richland, and Greenville make sense, are major population centers. And then some counties, look at this, Fairfield County, one case over the last five years. Cherokee, no cases. Oconee, two cases. But not, ma not many people down there. Nonetheless, TB occurs in, in most cases. And the question is, what's, what's going to be the quality of the of diagnosis and especially treatment, okay? Okay, so from an administrative point of view, uh, uh, DHEC divides the state into four regions, and uh, each region has one person, one physician who's responsible for medical care. He was Dr. Murphy. Have you gotten to know him, Gil? He came, came to us from Wyoming, of all places. In the Midlands, who's the medical director for the Midlands? There he is. Gil, you sure have a lot of counties there. And here's Dr. Gil Potter. Low Country is who? Catherine Arden and PD is Rick Irvin. Uh, do the four of you talk by phone sometimes about interesting cases? That's too good. Uh, so Gil, um, oh, so Gil, do you go out to all, all the homes of the TB patients here and do all the contact investigations? Is that what you, is part of your job? You mean it's actually the nurses who are doing all the work? Oh, I see. So the Midlands, you can loan your nurses to the PD to help them do their investigation. And upstate. Oh, <laughs> you've got to help. So, th so again, TB is, 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 is a public health is a team sport. Now, how does anybody know how many cases of TB there are in the U.S. or in South Carolina? Because CDC has this complex form called the RVCT, Report of Verified Case of Tuberculosis. It's a bit like filling out your, your income tax form. At the top here says patient's name and address. Do you think that gets sent to CDC or not? Not. They have no need to know. It's confidential. They don't know that is, that is Johnny Jones from 104 Main Street. But in the state, Gil, do you have to know the name of the patient? Because you're treating the patient and doing the contact investigation. So this used to, used to be a paper form that was mailed in. Now it's all done by, uh, filled in by hand and then, and then computerized. Um, site of disease, is it in the lungs or whatnot, all kinds of information. We'll go into this in detail. Initial drug regimen, how was the patient treated? Drug susceptibility reports, actually there's, there are reams of information there, okay? Um, and the, what's reported depends on um, the case definition for TB, and, and right now we're still using the, the case definition from, from 2009. And this is something which uh, we don't have to worry about here, 
but which a small number of TB professionals, very small number in South Carolina. How many people really have to know about this? It's about 15 people probably. Two or three, yeah, a couple in each region and a couple in the central office. And they're the ones who really understand what's happening about TB. And their laboratory criteria, and, and look at this, there's even a definition in 96 and in 1990. Uh, and sometimes when those definitions change, why would definitions change? Anybody have any idea? It could be new technology. New lab tests could be available now that weren't available then. And also, as the incidence of a disease declines, then the need for confirmation, accurate confirmation, rises. You know, when, ev when every child had measles, it was enough to look at a kid with a rash and say, well, that's measles, that's a case of measles. But since you've eliminated measles in the U.S., that is, there is no measles in the U.S. unless you have what? Importations from other countries which can start a short train of transmission. So measles is so rare that anything that you want to call measles you would better verify. But that wasn't part of the definition before. So as the epidemiology changes, the case definition may change. And as technology changes, uh, the definition may change. How can you learn about TB? Well, um, I showed this to the medical students, and they said they all use Harrison's internal medicine. I say there's 19, 19 pages of TB there, and in my infectious disease book, we have 36 pages about TB. That's nothing. How about this book? 400 pages about TB. How about this one? Oh dear, 900 pages. There's no end to it. Gil, have you read all 900 pages of that book? <laughs> no way. The books are there for us to, to consult. There are other things that we do read, however, okay? For practical purposes, the best resource is at cdc.gov slash TB. And look at this, you have basics, testing, treatment, drug resistance, guidelines, there's no end to it. And when you click on e each one of those 10 things, then you'll get, what, 10 more subheadings. See, this is basic TB, TB basics, and they divide that up into nine sub-basics, oh dear all that. And if you click on any one of those, what will happen? There'll be nine more subfolders, okay? For example, testing. Who should be tested? What about testing someone's had BCG before? Healthcare workers, testing during pregnancy. That's interesting. So, reams of information there. Treatment. Look, all these complicated things. And that's only the beginning. How about treating people who also have HIV or treating in pregnancy? So, um, and you can, online you have all this complicated information, nine months treatment, six months, three months, all kinds of things, four months, different drugs. And then the nice thing there on the CDC website is that they have very good fact sheets. This would be an example of a one or two page fact sheet which you can give patients. I like this one. If you're taking isoniazid for latent TB infection, there's even, it even, they can even circle here which days they're supposed to take their medicines. Look at that, Gil. Isn't that nice? Okay. Um, if you're a general practitioner in the community and you want to know about treating latent TB infection, then here's a nice 36 page, not too technical, but kind of basic summary. But if you're a professional, then you have to read, look at this, official guidelines from whom? American Thoracic Society, they're interested in diseases of what? The lungs. Okay. Uh, CDC for public health and who else? The Infectious Disease Society of America. So these are three major bodies which will have an expert team. Look at this, 20 people and they come out with their statements and this one, this one happens to be uh, about 50 pages but very, very dense. Now we have about 10,000 clinicians in South Carolina how many clinicians ha have read even one of these statements, do you think? I don't think even the ID docs are. They're not, because the ID doctors, you've met Dr. Albrecht, for example, shouldn't be mentioning his name, other people, they may diagnose TB in the hospital. And then they let the patient go. We don't hospitalize patients for TB anymore. The treatments are going to be where? In their home county. Supervised by whom? Medically by Dr. Potter and administration of medicines by the public health nurses. So none of the ID doctors have ever done a contact investigation. None of them have supervised therapy. None of them have seen patients through to the end. 
they're looking at the first four days, not the remaining uh, 176 days and all the public health things that, that go beyond it. So I think it's a, a very small number. These are very hard to read. The main thing is to have these available so you can look things up when you need to. This one's very good. Uh, do you use this one, Gil, or do your nurses use this one? Yeah. This kind of a chance to see, have everything in, in one big book. It's about 300 pages, but it, it, in a friendly manner, okay? And look at this one. So there are many of these uh, statements. This is from uh, um, a CDC special article, how to control TB in the US, not how to treat TB, how to control TB, different point. Uh, how to prevent transmission in healthcare settings. Who would read this? In all of Columbia, South Carolina, who's going to read this 130 page document cover to cover? Mimi, it's the infection control nurses in the major hospitals. So at Palmetto Richland, Baptist, Providence, this is very detailed and technical. It deals also, it's not just the medical part. This is not the medical part. This is how to make sure that, that we don't have transmission of TB within the hospital from patient to patient or patient to staff, let alone from staff to patient. Do you see what I mean? This involves engineering things and, and, and all kinds of things. So I'm glad we have a few students here because people think, oh, TB is a disease. You're sick, you go to the doctor, you're diagnosed and you're treated. That's kind of the, that's the bottom of the iceberg. That's the bottom, that's the top of the iceberg. That's the 1% and the 99% is all there. Guidelines for using interferon gamma release assays and so forth. Uh, for years, CDC had been funding these uh, regional training and medical consultation centers. Actually, they've just changed the name. I was surprised. It's now called Centers, centers of Excellence, Gil. I don't know why they changed the name. So um, th the one that whose territory we reside is shown down here in Florida, Southeastern National TB Center. Uh, anybody in this room? Pardon me? This is very weird. I, I can understand as far as Tennessee and Kentucky, but Illinois, Wisconsin and Minnesota in the southeast, <laughs> that is a, a little odd, uh, but that's how they d divided the country. Anybody in this room down, been down to the t uh, TB Center in Florida? Who? Raise your hand. Gil, why would someone from South Carolina go all the way to Florida? Because as the incidence of TB has declined, the amount of expertise in many states has also declined, and therefore we need places where uh, physicians and laboratory people and others can go for training and consultation. So for us, it's down here in Florida. Okay. All right. The, the, uh, well, the, uh, the, the university based, but they 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 have they have federal funding. So up here, uh, the Northeast here, this is actually at Rutgers in New Jersey. Um, this is the Curry Center in San Francisco. Uh, what this is Heartland in Texas, Gil. This is a what, is it, this is university based also, is it not? Yes, what, is that University of Florida or South? University of Florida. Very interesting. Okay, but they must they must have a federal grant. The one the one that was up uh, up here in Minnesota, that was actually based at the Mayo Clinic, and they had a grant for a while, but somehow they somehow they lost they lost the grant, and that most of the others must be university based. And this is a good idea because uh, you can't have everybody, can't have Atlanta at CDC headquarters doing all this consultation and training. It's kind of spread out and people can go there for short courses. Well, I'm going to show a few more slides and we'll stop for questions because we're getting close to the, close to the end of the hour here. Um, we've been talking about TB, but I really didn't discuss too much about what TB is. We'll go through a couple slides quickly. Tuberculosis. The TB that concerns us is TB in the lungs. TB can affect any organ in the body, and we call that extra pulmonary. But from a public health point of view, it's only the TB in the lungs that matters because that's the, that's the kind that can what? Be transmitted to others, okay? So people often have um, cough and fever and weight loss and so forth, and the x-rays look awful. Sometimes they have, um, often in the upper lobes, they have uh, infiltrates and cavities and Diff different clues that we have, you know, if someone is, if, if they lived in a, 
with someone who had TB, that's a risk factor. They're from a high incidence country, certain medical risk factors and so forth. Okay. Um, a bit about the history. Prior to the 40s, we didn't have drugs to treat TB. Drugs started to come in in the 40s and 50s, but it wasn't really until we had not just one, but then two or three or four good drugs that could be used in combination for complicated reasons that we were able to treat TB successfully. No longer in 18 months, but down to nine months or down to six months of therapy, sometimes even less. Um, and this is just a reminder that TB was, look at this in the 1900, pneumonia, influenza, TB, diarrhea and enteritis and diphtheria among the top leading causes of death in the US. And I think we'll end up with a couple of slides about the, uh, TB history. In the old days, there was a whole separate health infrastructure of TB hospitals, TB sanatoriums. Look at these giant buildings here. And even right here in Columbia at the State Park, if you go up, what's that, Park Lane, to where Park Lane meets Farrow Road, you come to State Park, and there, oh, brand new building, the State Archives, the DHEC State Laboratories. But look at this big building here. That was the last TB hospital in South Carolina. And in the old days, used to do mass screening for TB and so forth. This is all gone by the wayside. This was treatment for TB before we had TB drugs. Send people to a nice hospital like this, have them relax on the porch. Did that cure them of TB to relax on the porch? No, but at least they weren't where? They weren't in the community spreading TB. So this had a, may not have had much personal health benefit, but public health benefit. TB being spread through the air from one person to another to another, this could be over several decades. And this is the last slide that I'll show here. What, we would, what do we want to do? We want to interrupt transmission of TB because if someone had done it here, we wouldn't have had a case down there. So why do we treat patients with pulmonary TB? The man in the street, and sometimes even the doctor in the street, thinks, oh, we have a sick patient. We want to make them feel better. But from a public health and epidemiological point of view, why do we treat TB? To interrupt the chain of transmission. And uh, <coughs> those are things which we discuss in some detail. The uh, infectious disease epi class, which I teach every fall. And actually, Tony, this Wednesday, I'm going to be giving the talk with some um, statistical issues about how can we measure the intensity of transmission of TB in a population, okay? That's kind of beyond this particular lecture. So let me stop here. Um, I hope that's been a, a good overview about uh, some aspects of TB from a local, national, and global perspective, and can encourage you to look for more on the, on, on the web if you like, and I'll be glad to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much.